We had a wall in our house, this house that we lived in in Chicago, that had a crack in it. There was a wall in the basement, so it was a foundational crack, and it was a good one. Kind of one of those you might find where it goes from the very top to the bottom, and typical wall crack foundational form. This crack went diagonally and crooked and was kind of ugly. And you can see it when you went to the basement. It sat right behind all of our laundry equipment and cabinets and all of that, but it was, it was visible. And every time I went to the basement, speaking for myself, I had just a little bit of dread seeing this crack, wondering when the time would come when water would come pouring through that crack. Now someone before us had hired a contractor to inject a sealant into that crack. And it, that seemed to work because there never was any water. I don't remember any seepage, leakage, nothing like that. But right outside this wall of our house was where the water from the driveway and from the backyard and from that side of the house down the roof, it all pooled right there. So whenever it rained, even just a little bit, we'd have this lovely little pond just sitting right up against the house. I mean, it's probably why the crack was there to begin with. So it would rain and a little bit of dread would fill into the back of my mind, wondering if this was the time that the ceiling would fail, the wall would fail, and we would have water in our basement. So the church that I served at that time, we had contractors there, and they told me what I already knew, that the only way that you can really fix a crack in a foundation like that is you gotta dig down, you gotta excavate, and you gotta get it from the outside. That would pro provide a permanent solution, which is great. Except that for our house, besides the fact that the driveway was there and the garage was right behind the house and excavating out would mean destroying the driveway and having no access to the garage and probably no access to the backyard, at least from the outside. Our, this particular yard was long and narrow. Besides that, the air conditioning unit sat in that spot too, so we would have to disconnect that and remove that. And there was just a whole bunch of things. And let's not even talk about what the expense of all this would be. So needless to say, it never happened. We lived with a crack in our foundation that, at least for me, every time I went to the basement, I looked at it and wondered to myself, maybe this is the time. And that's kind of how we approach things. We seek solutions to problems. It's kind of how we're wired, right? When we think about our lives, we look in a mirror, we maybe, whether we ask for it, whether our neighbors ask for it or not, we might do it for our neighbors as well. We think about solutions to problems. How can we fix the situation? What's the five point plan that we can develop to get ourselves from where we are, get our neighbors from where they are, get our government from where it is, to where it can optimally function? Problems and solutions, questions and answers. We have this gospel for today where we're gathering around water and Jesus comes to John and John sees Jesus and pretty much says, you don't need to be here pushes them away the same way you and I would because maybe we approach baptism as a solution to a problem. We probably, as good humans, we probably even approach the Bible itself as answers to questions, solutions to problems. We have that wiring in our head. We can look back through the scripture and look at all these different stories as a way for God adjusting or God fixing or God responding to problems with new solutions. Go all the way back to that first creation story. It begins, the earth was a formless void and there was chaos in the waters and the Spirit of God, the presence of God, the breath of God, however it's translated in your Bible, is dwelling with those waters. So God is in the midst of the chaos with us, but God is also, as we might see that creation story, God is providing order to chaos. So as some of us might know, that first creation story has seven days. In each one of those days, God seems to be adding a little bit of order, a little bit of a fix, a little bit of a, a solution to our humanness. You have the story of Abraham and Sarah. They are worried about their legacy. They would like to have a child. They give that problem to God. God responds. I mean, God responded before that because Abraham already had a son named Ishmael with a woman named Hagar, but we kind of take that story and push it out of the way. Abraham and Sarah have a child. His name is Isaac. Isaac seems to be a solution to a problem. Later on in the history, the Israelites find themselves enslaved in Egypt. Clearly a problem. They cry out to God seeking resolution, and God responds. God sends Moses and Aaron and Miriam, they come as a three-pack, and God sends them in as emissaries to deal with the Pharaoh. Doesn't work, God says, fine, I'm getting you out myself, and then gets them across the Red Sea. We've all seen that movie. 
And then the Israelites wander in the wilderness on their way to the promised land. Another solution to a problem. You and I are wired to look for fixes because you and I are wired as humans to also see our problems. See our problems in ourselves, see our problem in our neighbors, see problems in this church, see problems in our community, and we want fixes. We want solutions. It's why some of us gather around tables with friends and sip coffee or drink wine and fix the problems of this world. If only we had a, a better government, if only we had a better medical system, if only we had a better educational system, if we could adjust the curriculum in this way or that way, or if we could adjust the way people walk in the world, or Lord knows if we could adjust our own way of walking in the world. We may even approach baptism itself as a solution to a problem. If only we could dive into these waters, maybe some of our dysfunction would go away. Maybe some of our disorder would be fixed. Maybe some of what is broken about us, what disappoints us about ourselves, maybe that would be resolved because we would be closer to God. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter, 13, chapter 3, verse 13 is where we begin, but the story of baptism begins all the way at the beginning of chapter 3, and that is where John the Baptist, standing around the water is calling people in a big broad clarion call all these people start showing up and John is presenting baptism potentially in our minds as a solution to a problem John says come get baptized to change your heart and life I mean who among us here gathered in God's house who among us wouldn't want to have our heart and our life changed by God come to these waters for a change of heart and life. It sounds like a solution to a problem. And people show up. Lots of people show up, Matthew tells us. And so does Jesus. Jesus shows up too. And John responds to Jesus the same way you and I would. Why are you here? John, now he's a cousin, so maybe he can speak a little bit more directly than you and I can. But, but John tells Jesus, more or less, go away. This isn't for you. This is totally unnecessary. In fact, you should be baptizing me because I need a change of heart and life. I need a solution to the problems in my life. You could be that solution, but you don't need fixing. You're already good to go. Jesus responds to us, responds to John, with an interesting turn of phrase. And if there's nothing else about this meandering sermon that you have to endure, I want to invite you to have three words stuck in your head. Because these three words that Jesus speaks shape the Gospel of Matthew and shape the way that we think about baptism. Jesus responds to John by saying, I need to get into these waters because it will fulfill all righteousness. That's the English translation anyway. Three words, fulfill all righteousness. Righteousness. That's one of those great churchy words. We bounce around walls like this. It sounds like a whole lot of things and sounds like it means a lot. And it's actually also in our minds absolutely meaningless because we don't know what it means. Righteousness sounds like, and one way that we might translate it, one way we might find it in our Lutheran writings, is that it's we're being made right by God. And maybe there's a portion of that. In fact, maybe it would be fun sometime for us to get together. I know I conjure up all these adult forums and learning centers that never happen, but imagine us getting together and talking about baptism and pouring in all the words that we've grown up with and then wondering together how many of those words are just coded language for solution to a problem. Fulfill all righteousness sounds like God is going to make us right. God is going to fix a problem through these waters. Except that the way that God uses the word righteousness in the Hebrew writings that come before Matthew, often God is using righteousness as a way to express the way God functions with us. And one of the ways that is significant in our relationship with God is that God makes promises. And how we know that God is right is that God does not break promises. See, what, what Jesus is doing is Jesus is coming to the waters not because he needs to be fixed and not even necessarily the people in the water need to be fixed. Jesus is coming to the water simply because that's where you and I are. God needs to be where we are. God needs to dwell where we exist. 
So if the people are in the water, Jesus is going to get into the water because that is the rightness of God. Wherever we are, God wants to be with us. God dwells with us. God loves us. Remember that first creation story, how it begins? The earth is a formless void. There's chaos in the waters and the spirit of God, the presence of God, the breath of God is moving over those waters. So yes, we can look at that story as God creating order out of chaos. But even before that, God's in the chaos. God is where we exist. God is where we dwell in the midst of our dysfunction, in the midst of our brokenness, all the ways we might identify ourselves in our, in our imperfectness. God already sees us as beloved people of God. In all the ways that people might apply to us, telling us that we are imperfect or less than or broken or dysfunctional, God already sees you as a beloved child of God. So if we're in the water, God's going to get in the water with us. Jesus climbs into these waters to stand with us, to remind us again of the nearness of God's love to us, that wherever we wander in this world, God is going with us. God makes promises with us. Now, if somebody wanted to get baptized this morning, we could do that. We, could, we have all the words. They're in our red books right here. We could speak them all together. We would gather around that person, and we would speak these promises that we will remember again in just a few minutes here in worship. And you and I know that every promise we make with God, we will ignore. We will break it. We will deny it. We will go our own direction because that's what we do. But God who is right, maintains every promise. God made a promise with you to be with you. God makes a promise with you to love you. God promises you that God will forgive you. And the rightness of God is that God will fulfill every promise for you and through you, for your neighbor and through your neighbor, for your loved ones and through your loved ones, for this community, for this church, because this is what God does. As it turns out, every promise that God makes with us, it's not really dependent on what we say or what we do or what we don't do or what we don't say or how we walk in the world or how we manage or not manage our dysfunction. In our relationship with God, it is God who loves. It is God who forgives. It is God who blesses. It is God who stays with us. So Jesus gets in the water so that we can know the nearness of God. We use language of rising up out of these waters and we are made new in Christ. It doesn't mean that our old self is absolutely gone because you and I know we can receive communion as often as we want and as soon as we circle back to our pews, we immediately become ourselves. But what that means is that every time that we touch water, every time we remember again that we are loved by God, we remember the promise of God. That God has fulfilled all righteousness through you. You are made right with God. You are complete, even as God is shaping us and transforming us and moving us in God's image and God's love. We rise out of these waters created by God, blessed by God, loved by God, and sent out into the world to share this good news with others, that God is near and God is here. Every day, when we rise out of these waters, when we wash our hands, when we do the dishes, when we feed the dog, when we see water outside, every time we encounter water, it is a reminder to us that in the presence of God, you are complete. You are beloved. You are encircled in God. And God is breathing life into you. Amen. Amen.